It's time to dig in and discuss the questions on the minds of today's leaders. You are listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. This is where we get vulnerable, raw, and authentic about the stuff that really matters. Now, here is your host, Kathleen Reeson. Welcome to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. Today's show is all about five ways to be present at work and at home. So we're giving you the tool set to be present. There's... (laughs) I like to think of your presence, being actually present as the biggest present. I said this to my kids this morning. I, they said, what's your topic on your show? And I said, oh, it's about presents. They're like, Christmas is coming up. Yay, you're talking about presents, like Christmas presents. And I just laugh because to them, that's what presence means. And we get to really focus on what presence means to us. And it's a question I've been asking myself a lot lately, a lot. And the what I found... I never would have labeled myself as somebody that was anxious. That's, you know, I don't, I don't consider myself a high anxiety person. So think about that for you. Do you consider yourself as someone that has anxiety and anxiety? Let's even, let's even give that a definition. That is where we're worried about the future. What could happen? What possibly could be the result when we're focused on something that's not actually occurring now, we are spinning our minds off into the focus of the future. So think about that on a scale of one to 10, 10 is like, I live in the future. I'm worried about the future. I am always thinking about the future versus one is like, nah, it's all about the moment. We could even go into a negative scale because, the, and I don't mean negative as in a bad thing. I mean, it, we're going the other way. So if you think of this linearly, if, if let's just say, let's make this really easy in ourselves. Okay. A scale of how <laughs> thinking through the scale this is making me laugh. Okay. So we've got two sides. We're on a a road. Okay. We're on a road. You can go to the left or you can go to the right. And you're standing in the middle. Middle is presence. This is where you are right now. You can go to the left or the right. If you go to the left, you're going to the past. You're stepping into the past. If you go to the right, you're stepping into the future. So by definition, depression would be about stepping into the past, living in the past, thinking about what it was like, missing the past. And the anxiety is about the future. So stepping into the right. So I want you to think about how much time do you spend living in the past, the present, or the future? The past, the present, or the future? Think about the conversations that you have. Are you talking about stuff that happened in the past? Are you you talking about stuff that may happen in the future? Are you talking about the moment? What's happening right now? So what I know to be true is that most people live in the past or the present. But truly living in the moment is actually the biggest challenge. And it's because our mind is geared to protect us. One of the shows that I I referenced, probably the most frequently of all of them, it's the show back in June. I had neuroscientists on there. He also happens to be my dad, but he's a neuroscientist. And he talked about how the brain is wired to protect us. Our brain is wired to protect us. We have these human instincts that stop us from growing because that's not comfortable. That's not safe. And so it holds us back. We say based on past experiences, we should or shouldn't do whatever it is we're going to do based on past experiences or into the future. Okay. So we've got depression is linked to the past, anxiety linked to the future, and then we've got the present. And so we get to decide where we live. Well, for me, one of the things that I want to do is I want to be present in the moment. So really experiencing the sights, sounds, tastes, smells, everything that happens in the moment. And that, again, because our brains are wired to protect us, thinks about what could go wrong. Future worry, that's anxiety. And so we are constantly looking around, scanning the room, seeing what could possibly happen. But that's not being present. So we actually have to counteract our mind to be present. So there's some tools that we're going to talk about today that are going to support you with that. Now, when I really thought about this and thought about this concept of presence and how do you actually be present in the moment, because let's be honest about this. If we were truly present in the moment, we would eat everything in front of us until our bellies were so full, we wouldn't save any food. We'd throw it all out because we're not focused on the future. We wouldn't save money. We would spend all of our money on whatever made us happy in the moment. And then the next moment we would figure out, oh, we don't have money. Okay. Well, what do we do now? And so there are some really 
really supportive tools to thinking about the future. So I'm not saying thinking about the future is bad. What I'm saying is that being present in the moment to our experience, to our feelings is really beneficial. So one of the things that brought this up for me was around the habits of eating. So I know that I could easily get caught up in not even thinking about what I am consuming in my mouth. So we just had Halloween here in the United States. My kids dressed up in these intricate costumes. My oldest was Dr. Strange and we couldn't find a Dr. Strange costume. So we made it in this costume. It had this robe and these, uh, it had belts and I mean, we spent days, not hours, days on this costume, but he was so proud of it at the end. And so the other two, they were, they allowed us, well, one of them was uh, Captain America. So that was a really easy costume, but the youngest, he wanted to be a devil in a blue suit. The only reason he wanted to be a devil in a blue suit is because he has this blue suit that he loves and he wanted to wear it to a first Halloween costume because he'd done it before and he just loves this blue suit. So I have these three children in these Halloween costumes. They go out, they collect all this candy and they come back and it's delicious candy. This isn't like the bad candy, like the, the in my mind, a Starburst. So that's not good quality candy. Come on, bring on the chocolate. I know I'm offending some people by saying that, but I really like like the chocolate, the Reese's, the the M&Ms, the Snickers, like the real chocolate stuff. So they came back with over 1,500 pieces of candy. Can you imagine? 1,500 pieces of candy. And a lot of those Reese's pumpkins, I love those things. And so all of this stuff enters our house, plus all the candy that we were giving away. So we have all of this candy, like an abundance of candy in our house. And I found that for the week after Halloween, I'm just eating this candy, like not nonstop, but quite a lot. (laughs) And I realized, why am I eating it? This is crazy. Do I really want this kind of food? And it goes back to presents. Why am I choosing to pick up that candy? Why would I want to feed my body that way? Because this isn't my natural habits, but when our minds just go into a different mode and we're not present in the moment, we just are reactionary. We grab food because it sounds good. Not because that's aligned with our vision of healthy eating. I, I wouldn't choose Reese's peanut butter cups if I was focused on my healthy eating, but it's easy for our minds to wander down that path. And again, being in the moment, we could easily say, well, I'm just going to eat as many Reese's peanut butter cups as I want. Cause I don't know if there's a tomorrow. So here I go and eating them and we get to have a balance. Okay. We get to have a balance. So what I'm talking about today is really mastering your mind to being present in the moment, but yet still seeing the future, still honoring the past, but being able to move forward with where we are now. And so there's a couple of tools that I've used when I studied presence, I watched where my mind was wandering to. And so I watched that like with the case of the Halloween candy, when did I pick up the candy? When was it easiest for me? And I noticed, well, when it's sitting out on the counter, it's easiest because it's right there. I walk by, I grab it. It's really easy. It's next to my, not very far away from my desk. So all I have to do is get up out of my chair and grab some candy. Well, that's not working. So for me, I bagged up the candy. I put it in a shelf above the fridge and I'm short, vertically challenged, however you want to say it, petite. uh, Anyway, all those words mean the same thing. I could not reach the candy which meant in order to get the candy, I either had to get the step stool out or I figured this out. My husband makes fun of me. But if I open up the refrigerator, because the refrigerator sits out a little bit from the cabinet, if I open up the drawer, then I can reach the top shelf. But that's a lot of work. And so I really have to think about getting that candy because it's not something that I'm just walking by. So now I have to be purposeful about it and I have to set an intention of, I would like some candy. Not because I want to nourish my body that way, not because it's the food of choice, but because I want candy. So when I set the intention that I want candy, then I go and either open the refrigerator door and grab the bag and bring it down, or I get the stool out and I get the candy. And so it, that's a space for me where I'm really noticing when I have these thoughts of, I want candy. Now, another thing that I noticed was that, as I mentioned, I really like Reese's peanut butter cups. These are really good. Well. I started working with a dietitian just to understand 
my, not because of the Reese's peanut butter cups. This goes deeper. I wanted to understand what my cravings were for me, what that meant, how I got to really tool my eatings, all the great reasons why you would visit a dietitian who's actually, by the way, her name is Laura Mars and, and she's going to be on the show in a few weeks. She's going to talk about holiday eating and how to set yourself up for success. So this whole thought process actually brought me to gifting you the, the same answers to these questions that I'm asking. You're welcome. So that's coming up here. I think it's December 6th, but more to come on that. So I, I asked Laura, what is it about these salt cravings? And she says, oh, well, what kind of salt is in your diet? And we started digging into it. And I realized that I use a kosher salt, but there's actually more of a mineral based salt. And so she had me incorporate that into some of my beverages. So that was a whole other thing. I just didn't even know about that. And so now I actually drink a beverage that has a little bit of salt in it. And all of a sudden, what I realized, I've been doing this now for about a week and a half, and I don't have that desire for the Reese's peanut butter cup. I actually don't even have the desire for the Snickers or the M&Ms or any of those things. It was filling that need for me, that mineral need that I didn't even know existed. But I didn't know this was a thing until I really looked at it and said, why am I wanting this? Why would I be willing to get up from my chair, open up the refrigerator or grab the stool and then get to the top counter? Like, what is it about that that's filling this need for me? And I can also say that growing up, candy was something that was available to me. And so it did feel good. Like when I went uh, shopping to the, if I went to the grocery store with my parents, the reward for me was I could have a candy bar. It's not something that I had often, but it was available to me. And so, so in some degrees, there's an emotional need that's filling as well. But when I started nourishing my body with this salt component, it, the emotional need wasn't as large. It was more about this physical health component that I didn't even know was there. So that was fascinating. But until we're really present with our patterns and understanding what's actually happening for us, we wouldn't even know that. So when Laura comes on, we'll talk more about that, but just something to think about. Another one that came up for me when I was really studying presence was I was with my dad and I've shared with you before, I say share with you, he's a neuroscientist and go check out that June episode on the mind. That was really cool. I want to say it was June 24th ish, but it's in the June shows. But one of the things that, so my dad has a chronic condition and we're, he's in the hospital about once every quarter. And so we were in there a few weeks ago. And when I, I make, I don't mean to make light of this because it is very serious when we were in there. And um, there was a point in the, the week that he was there. Usually he's there about three or four days. And this was almost a full week in. And uh, we weren't sure whether he was going to make it or not. That there were some signs that, that his condition wasn't actually going to fix itself and that we would have to take a drastic approach. And I remember sitting by his bed and watching my mind wander to what would happen if we have to take a more drastic approach? Would he be able to make it through that? And I went through these, this calculation and then I stopped myself because I, I caught myself and said, whoa, you are future worrying here. In this moment, the only thing that we know is that this is either going to reverse itself or it's not. This, that is our only path that is right or left. It's going to reverse itself or it's not. Now, if it doesn't reverse itself, then we get to walk down this path that you're on. But in this moment, that is not something that we have to worry about because it's not where we are. And so I caught myself and said, whew, Kathleen, what are you doing? Like, look at this future worry you're creating, this stress that you're creating in your body. Is it necessary? And in that moment, I got to say no. And as I reflect back on some of the really extreme things that we've been through, like my youngest son nearly dying a whole bunch of times, my husband's near-death experience, his cancer experience. I'm not even lumping, like, we were two separate experiences. He had histoplasmosis and almost died. It's a crazy experience. I actually wrote a lot about this in my book, Joy and Uncertainty, A Guide to Creating a Meaningful Life. So that's available on Amazon if it's something that you're interested in hearing that story. But when I look back on these experiences, I think about, did I put myself in future worry? And when you're in a trauma mindset where all you can think about is the moment, I don't believe that you have the capacity to future worry in that moment. All you can think about is the experience in front of you. And to some degree, that's valuable. That's valuable, that, that, that immediate response. Not all the stuff that comes after it. And <laughs> you've got trauma and you got other stuff you got to worry through. But in that exact moment when something big happens, it's about what do you fix in this moment? What is happening in this moment? Because you have to live 
in the moment when you're just choosing live or die, that moment, that experience. I believe that we can live through those experiences. Like in that moment when we're making those choices, we don't have time to think about future worry. We just don't have that. So we think about being very present. Sight, smell, touch, taste, feel. Our senses are alive in that moment. But how much of our lives are we living dead to those senses? Not knowing that those exist. Not actually being in relation to that. So this show today is about getting in relation to what's actually happening around us. We're going to go we're going to go on a quick break and when we get back I'm actually going to walk through the five tools that will support you in getting in relationship with those senses in being present in the moment both at work and at home. So stay tuned and enjoy this this quick commercial break. You're listening to the Kathleen Recent show on Inspired Choices Network. Talk to you here in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspire Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. And today we're talking about the five ways to be present at work and at home. So in that last 15 minute session, we talked about one of the biggest tools and we're going to call it forward now so that you can be aware of it. And it's notice moments. It's noticing when your mind is wandering into some other path. It's noticing when you want to grab the chocolate, when you're willing to open up the refrigerator door so that you have a better access to the top shelf where you have stored the chocolate. Now that's the chocolate for me. I'm sharing you. I'm being vulnerable, sharing with you what one of my weaknesses is. But think about what your weakness is. What is it for you that is that trigger where you go to, but it's almost unconscious to you. It's just something that you go to. So think about that. When you have that notice moment, it may not even be a physical movement. It may just be in your head. It may be with like COVID is, oh gosh, it's such a great example. Let me give you an example of a notice moment on this. This is another one for me, put this in relationship with you. So I have three boys and one of them comes home from Friday school, comes home, I pick him up and he's got a cold, not a big cold, just a little bit with a little runny nose. He's tired on a Friday night. He wakes up Saturday morning. He's great. He's feeling awesome. Four hours later, he's a little tired. He wants to take a nap. He doesn't usually take a nap, but he takes a nap. He's playing by himself. He's a little quieter than normal. And then he has a headache. So he decides he's going to go to bed early. And then Sunday morning, he wakes up. He's great. We're having a great day. Nothing happens. He is wonderful. But he's playing. He's just like he always is. And then you find out his friend that he spends a ton of time with just got diagnosed with COVID. So now my question for you is, what do you do? Like, what do I do in that situation? And so I have three kids, not just one. Do we go get tested? Do we not? The way our school system works in this moment is we don't test, but we can test. We absolutely can. But then if he's positive and he isn't showing symptoms anymore, you know, he's at home. And so it's it's this really big area where, you know, ethically we want to make sure that he is at home, but then do the other kids stay home? 
Because again, the way our school system is, the other kids can go back to school. And so I could e easily go into this future worry about, well, what happens if, if he tests positive and if the other kids have to stay home or do they or do they not? Or what's going to happen then? And then they have activities and we just cancel all that. And then what about the holidays that are coming up and blah, blah, blah. You hear the pace of my voice getting faster, more animated. I mean, these are all the things where it's so easy for our mind to get sucked into. But what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And the reality is in this moment, we really only have one choice. Do we or do we not get him tested? The kid in this moment, health-wise, is fine. Do we or do we not get him tested? That is the one question that we got to answer. But it's easy to let our minds go down this path of what if. And the reality is that's not serving us. Because if he tested and he was negative, it's irrelevant. None of those what ifs matter if it's negative. If it's positive, then we get to support some of these questions. But how often are we letting our minds wander to the what if before we even answer the question that is that would predate these what if questions? That is the very definition of stress that we put ourselves, our bodies, our relationships under because we're not present in the moment. And so this tool, this tool of noticing these notice moments of when we go down those what ifs paths, noticing that we're going down that path. The first step is always awareness. It's just noticing that this is something that's a pattern for us, that we have a what if pattern, that we tend to go into the what ifs, into the scenarios, into the future worry, instead of being present with what is the decision that I get to make now? I have a lot of executives that come to me and they say, I want to make decisions quicker, faster, better, more efficient, more effective, you know, all those, those adjectives, but they want to make decisions faster. And the reality is this, is, this is what we come down to. It is not about, when you're making decisions, it's not about actually making the decision. What I found is that most people can make the decision quickly. It's getting out of the space of the what if worrying and just being very grounded in what the actual question is. Because in that same scenario that I just painted with my sons, it could be very easy to convince myself that the question that I'm answering is, should I send my other two boys to school tomorrow? Now, the reality is, I don't even know, in that, in that case yesterday, it, was, it wasn't whether I should send the other two kids to school, it's whether I should send the middle one. But it could be really easy to misinterpret the challenge and answer the questions that aren't relevant to the real challenge. Remember, the challenge was, should we get him tested or not? Because if it's negative, all the rest of that stuff is pointless. But how much time do we spend, <coughs> excuse me, focused on the question that isn't really the question? It's not really the question. So notice moments, noticing when your mind does that. Because your mind, again, it's set up to comfort you, to keep you safe not to propel you forward, not to expand your boundaries, not to really embrace growth mindset. So notice moments. That's the first tool. Have them. Allow yourself to really be curious about what's happening. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So notice that. You can even write this in a notebook. You could, you could jog it and put it down in your notes on your phone. But just really be clear about how often your mind is wandering. When I did this, so this is, this is the exercise I've been through for the past few weeks, is just being really clear about when I'm not being present with what's happening around me. So do that for yourself. Do that for a week, two weeks. Just notice when you're having a challenge with your mind going into a separate space. Notice when your mind wanders into the what ifs. So you can call this a notice moment and you can look for the what ifs. That is tool number one. Now tool number two goes hand in hand with that. Tool number two is about a practice of meditation. Now let's talk about meditation. Some people love meditation. Some people hate meditation. I have what I would lovingly recall, refer to as a love-hate relationship with meditation. I love the idea of it. I dislike the practice of it. And I, like many of you, perhaps like you, I like to be on the move. I like to move forward quickly. 
Meditation is about being present in the moment, grounded, quiet. And nothing about Kathleen enjoys quiet in the space, stopping, pausing. I want to be moving forward. I want to be focused in action. And so I have friends that love meditation, 60 minute out, two hour long meditation sessions. And those are beautiful for them. But it's not the practice for me. For me, my stretch goal is like two minutes of meditation. Two minutes. So hear that. I have friends that do, one of my, my best friends, she has shower meditations or bath meditations. So she'll take like an hour long bath and she'll talk about all these things that she got during that session. And that, that space is not for me at this point. It might be in the future, but it's not for me in this moment. But the two minute meditation, now that is my thing. So hear that when I'm talking to you about meditation, what I'm really opening up is that it doesn't have to look a certain way. Meditation gets to be whatever you want it to be. Really, the whole purpose of the meditation is to be with your thoughts. So when we're looking at tool number one, which is those notice moments, that's really being present to your thoughts all day long, knowing when your brain is moving away. Meditation is about in that specific set of time, noticing your brain moving away and bringing it right back, noticing your your mind moving away and bringing it right back. And what are you bringing it back to? You're bringing it back to yourself, to your breaths. So when I meditate, what I do is I'll go to a, as quiet of a space as I can find. Now, when my kids are home, that's a little bit challenging. So it might be in the morning for a couple of minutes when I know that they don't know that I'm up yet. My youngest, if I open my door in any way, or there's even footsteps, he is pouncing out of jumping off his bed into my room. Like somebody's up. It's like, he's got a, got a, a, some kind of video system in my room where he can see this movement, like triggers a light in his room or something. I don't know. But what I'm saying is that I get to be really strategic about the times that I choose this. So what I'll do, maybe even just laying in bed, but it's not first thing. I want to make sure that I'm awake, but it could be shortly after that. And then I can just put two minutes on my phone or I can just note the time. But for you, especially when you're beginning this, just put a two minute timer on your phone and close your eyes. Now, what I found was even putting my hands on my chest because that's going to ground me to, to my physical self. Remember when I was talking about this whole, this whole show is really about being in relationship to your senses, like knowing what's around you, being present. So putting your hands on your body, you can actually feel your breasts that way. And so it brings you back to what's actually happening in the moment. So your mind can't play tricks on you when you physically have a grounding like that. So just putting your hands over your chest, feeling your breath, your breaths, closing your eyes. And then for two minutes, you're just, you're going to use those notice moments that we talked about in tool number one, and you're just going to notice breathing. So in, out. And as your mind wanders, you start to think about something else. Great. You're not making yourself wrong because you're thinking about something else, but you're going to bring yourself back to that moment that you're in now. Maybe you have a candle burning. Some people I know what, this is not a practice that I've used, but they'll burn a candle and they'll actually just watch the flame. So it's the same thing or uh, watching birds. So if you're a bird watcher, uh, I, I heard this demonstrated and I'm not a bird watcher either, but I thought this was a beautiful relationship. I had talked with a bird watcher and he says, I don't watch the birds because I really enjoy different species of birds. I watch the birds because the birds represent connection to the outside world. And so it's just being present to what's happening around you, listening to the sounds, watching the movement. It's the same thing. But here when we're, we're the, the exercise that I'm giving to you is a tool that you can use to connect into yourself. So for two minutes, you're just listening feeling your breaths, feeling like maybe there's a, a scent in the air. You're just going to be really present to that. And then when your mind starts to wander, notice it and bring yourself back to your breaths. And over time, as you work through this, the amount of times that your brain wanders will decrease. But this whole thing is a practice. Like this is not some, it's not, it's not something that you just do overnight. You're great. Like, oh, I got it. This whole art of being present is truly a practice. I've gotten better at it, but I still have a long way to go. So the tools that I'm sharing with you are truly just things that I've 
I've been thinking about and wondering about, and I'm sharing with you my knowledge to support you. So we're going to go on another quick break. And when we get back, I will share with you more of the tools. So you've heard the first two. The first one is your notice moments. Notice when you're going into that future worry, when you're spinning off into the what ifs. The second one is meditation. So stay tuned after this break. We'll go into even more. You're listening to the Kathleen Recent Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here at Inspired Choices. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Recent Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. I'm your host, Kathleen Reeson, here on Inspired Choices Network. And for the past 30 minutes, we've been talking about the five ways to be present at work and at home. We've covered the first two, which are your notice moments, wondering about your what ifs, where you're creating future worry. And the second one, which is meditation. We're going to move into the third one, which is about being intentional, being intentional. It's very easy to get into a reactionary space where we just do things because we do them, but we forget about why we're doing them. When we really think about why we're doing them, there may not be a good reason and we may eliminate it. It may be something that we just don't need to do. So I'll give you a perfect example. If, if what really is valuable to you isn't something that's valuable to somebody else, does that mean you shouldn't do it? I thought about that question a lot. If it's valuable to me, but it's not valuable to somebody else, should I still do it? And the answer for me is yes, because it's valuable to me. It doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks, but it's valuable to me. And so then the question becomes, what is valuable to me? And so I had a situation that I was sharing earlier. Uh, we are getting our roof replaced. So here I live in Iowa. We have rough winters. And so we're getting our roof replaced. And I'm very excited about getting our roof replaced, even though it's going to be banging and not so fun for a few days. So we went through this whole process with our insurance company to get our roof replaced. And luckily, it will be covered mostly under insurance. So it, we turned out we started this process in early October. And... Here we are uh, in the United States. We are in Thanksgiving week. So we have all kinds of family traveling in on Thursday for Thanksgiving to our house. And the roofers can come this week or next week. But here's the deal. In my world, what's valuable to me is decorating for Christmas. I love decorating for Christmas. I actually create a Grinch scene outside. Now this Grinch scene, I wanna give you a little bit backstory on this. The reason I started the Grinch, Grinch scene is that in 2018, the winter of 2018, uh, the, about this time, actually, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And my husband usually put up the Christmas lights. So I would support, would help with decorating ideas. I wouldn't even hang, support hanging the lights, but I was never the lead on hanging the lights. I did not enjoy getting on the ladder, especially tall uh, the top of our house and putting lights up. I just did not enjoy it. I wasn't comfortable doing it. I didn't want to do it. So my husband has cancer and he started his chemotherapy the week of Thanksgiving. So like this week in 2018, so three years ago. And uh, we hadn't put up Christmas lights. He'd been sick before that and it wasn't, wasn't a priority. And now it was the weekend before, Chris, before Thanksgiving. So it was this weekend, this past weekend that we just had three years ago. And my friends had offered to take our boys 
and they went to this jump place. The boys had a great time. So I basically had the day free. And my husband, since he just had chemotherapy, he was sick. So he was on the couch. There was nothing that I, he didn't really require support. He just got to rest. And I thought, oh, I got to tag all these Christmas lights. I did not want to hang the lights. So instead, I decided that I was going to drive his, my husband's truck to the hardware store and get a giant four foot by eight foot plywood <laughs> of plywood. And then I would come home and I would use power tools, which I don't really use very often. This was one of my first this kind of forte into power tools. And I found this pattern of this Grinch. And so I drew the Grinch on the plywood. And now my dad, who also could help me with this, was having, he had had surgery about the same time and was recovering. And Josh's dad was, was, had a few other things going on. So basically all the people that would have normally supported me with this were like out of commission. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to use these power tools. I, I draw the Grinch out. I use the power tools. I, I cut it all out. I didn't cut myself. I was so proud. And then I painted the Grinch. And it just took me all day to make this Grinch. And so I get the Grinch set up and then I got the Christmas lights. And I really only needed to use two strands because if you've ever seen the Grinch who stole Christmas, he's actually pulling lights off of the house. So I thought, here's what I'll do. I just have to get up the little ladder, which doesn't go very far. I'm fine with that puts a few lights on the house and then it'll look like the Grinch has already gotten most of the lights off of the house. Like this is perfect. And so, yes, I did spend the entire day crafting the Grinch, but the actual part that I didn't like, the getting up on the ladder, that was very minimal. I bought two strands of C9 Christmas lights. I hung them on the roof and I put the Grinch in the yard. I actually had to have our neighbor come over because the Grinch was so large. I said, Ryan, can you come over? I got to hammer this into the ground because I had these metal stakes for it. I mean, this was intricate. So I got the Grinch all up. I was so proud of my work. <laughs> it was really impressive. And I never had to get the giant ladder out and, and, and get at the top. And it brought me so much joy. So the next year rolls around and now my husband, who is quite capable of hanging lights on the roof, he, he says, what's this Grinch thing? Like, we should, let's do this Grinch. So we do the same thing the next year. But I think, huh, we should add to this. So I make Cindy Lou Who. I paint the, the, the plywood. I, you know, I got more plywood. I painted it. I made Cindy Lou Who and Max. So now there's the Max Grinch and Cindy Lou Who. We've got quite the scene outside. And so we hang just a few lights and this is great. And then 2020 happens and like everything else, nothing, nothing changed. We used the exact same scene. We didn't add a single thing to it, but we did not have to climb on the roof to do the lights. Well, as all great things go, my children this year, they said, mom, I really like the Grinch, but wouldn't it be great? Like what would bring them joy? And, and one of my missions in life, I love seeing them enjoy. And I love seeing others enjoy, and I love being the spark for that. So uh, they said, what if the Grinch, what if he was just starting taking off the lights instead of finishing? And I thought, oh, no, this is, this is in reverse of my plan. Like, you guys, this is the reverse of it. This was the original plan was that he was almost done. I only had to put a little bit of lights on it. But they, that's what they wanted. And my husband was enrolled in getting out the giant ladder. So... At the same time, my youngest says, mom, let's up our game. Let's build more. So, okay. So we go to the hardware store and I get two, not one, but two giant sets of plywood this year. And I paint an eight foot Christmas tree. I think if this, like the way, if you've seen the Grinch tree, it kind of bends at the top. And so this is probably actually like a 12 foot tree, but it's, it's arched. So we have this giant Christmas tree that I painted. I spent all Saturday painting the Christmas tree and some Who's. We made a Whoville decoration and then the fireplace. It looks really cool. Like, I'm really proud of the work. There was a consequence though. <laughs> I spent nine hours painting on Saturday and my left arm, my tricep hurt so bad. I, can, I can't actually extend my arm straight. So there was a consequence for that. But uh, the intention was to create joy. And those lawn displays are, they're out on the lawn right now. The lights aren't on yet because we follow a somewhat strict policy here, not set by me. 
to wait to turn our Christmas lights on until after Thanksgiving, which here in the U.S. is Thursday. So we will officially display all of our crazy creations Thursday night. But I tell you this really long story because that brings me so much joy. And yes, did I spend nine hours on Thursday or on Saturday crafting this tree and you know, all these intricate displays? Yes, but the intention of doing that was to bring joy. And it absolutely brought joy. And that's why I did it. That is absolutely why I did it. And it's why I spent yesterday, so the rest of the weekend, supporting my husband in building bases. And I actually, the way that this worked out, I said I will draw on the plywood, but I enrolled my dad into coming and cutting it for me because I didn't want to use the power tools. I enrolled my husband in hanging the big lights from the rest of the house because that was not something that brought me joy. Now, in the past, I might have been the one that just did it. But that's what I mean when we think about the intention and the reactionary. There are actually people around us that really want to support us. And so when we're present with what really brings us value and what we enjoy, what what we know that we like, there are others around us that enjoy the other pieces. My dad loves to cut the wood and he he loves to, he, the, the actually art of cutting out this Christmas tree in the fireplace. He really enjoyed that. And if I wouldn't have been present to me not liking it and enrolling him in doing it, we would have missed that opportunity. Now, I'll be even more specific about this. So we run a martial arts company. And in that business, we host birthday parties. We are so honored when kids choose to spend their birthday parties with us, when they want to celebrate their birthdays in our gym. We have a, a very family atmosphere. And so when they say, yes, I want to do that, that's exciting for us. That's exactly what we've been working to create. And so we had somebody the other day that said, yes, I want to be here. I want to have my birthday at your facility. We thought, how cool is that? And then when we stopped and thought about it, uh, when it actually what came to executing of it, we fell short. We absolutely fell short. And I'm not saying that like there's no, there's no right or wrong, right? That was just an, an opportunity to learn. But we didn't follow our procedures. We didn't create what we possibly could have to make sure that this went off flawlessly. And what I realized was we stepped out of our intention. We stepped into the mechanism. So I know on the show we've covered before intention plus mechanism equals results, but intention is why we do what we do. Mechanism is how we get it done. If we only focus on the mechanism, how we get it done, we forget why we're doing it. And when we forget why we're doing it, it gets painful. It doesn't, it just never works. And so if you want to be present in the moment, you want to know, like you want to remember why you do it. Why do we do birthday parties at the gym? Because we celebrate family moments there. It's really about family. And if one of our family members is having a birthday, of course we would have a birthday party. Of course we would. So that just makes sense. But when we forget about the intention and we just focus on the mechanism, it never works. So in this case, we fell down on the birthday party because we weren't thinking about it from a standpoint of this is one of our family members. I would never tell my kids, no, we can't celebrate your birthday. We're too busy. We would figure it out. We'd see who could celebrate it, who could be there, what could it look like. We'd be in possibility. That's where starting with the intention. So tool number three, think about that. How often are you thinking about the intention before you enter into it? How often do we just focus on emails? How often do you just go check your email? Not because it's actually the time that works best for you to check your email. It's just because out of habit, you're scanning through your emails and then something comes up that you really aren't in a position to respond to, but you feel like you should, so you do. And then fast forward into the future, you create these results where you think, gosh, if I would have just waited to respond to that when I was in a position to be able to do it, maybe it was a thought out message crafted from your keyboard on your computer, not from your phone, it would have made a difference. But how often do we reactionary create moments of time that if we were really present and said, what is the intention of how I'm going to spend this moment? How often would it change our results? Just think about that. How often would it change your results? I know for me, when I get to really study this practice of presence, it was quite a bit was quite a bit of reactionary time that I was creating that could have easily, easily been moved to a different time or just eliminated altogether. All right, guys, we have one more break. When we get back, I'm going to quickly share with you the last two tools. These are ones that are going to be easy for you to get. We'll wrap this all up. 
You are listening to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. I'm your host, Kathleen Reeson. Enjoy this quick break. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. And today we've been talking about the five ways to be present at home and at work. Number one are the notice moments, noticing how often your brain moves into the future worry, the what if scenarios. Number two is the art of meditation. Number three is about setting the intention for whatever act you are choosing to do versus just doing it. Number four is about reflecting daily. So it's at the end of the day and it's saying, what actually did I create based on the intention? What did I create? What I realized when I was in this practice is that I place more value on the professional accomplishments than I do my personal accomplishments. It's not because I truly don't like my personal accomplishments, but I would say if I completed a presentation or I spoke at a conference, I would give that a higher ranking than getting my kids to all their activities. Now, it's not that I don't value that. It's just, if you would have said to me, Kathleen, what did you accomplish this week? And let's say I got all my kids to their activities. There are numerous on time. Like I did all of that, but professionally, I ran my radio show, I coached some executives, I uh, spoke at a conference, I, and you say, what did you do, what did you accomplish this week? I would first go to the professional side, then I would about the personal side. This is what I was noticing. And so I got to be really present about why do I value the professional accomplishments at a greater level than I do the personal accomplishments? For me, what I'm learning, and and this is not something that I learned, it's something that I'm learning because I am in the process. I'm sharing with you from a vulnerable space what's coming up for me because this stuff is real. When we're talking about being present, we really get to see what's standing in the way. So for me, something was standing in the way from valuing those personal accomplishments at the rate of of the professional accomplishments. And what I found so far is that for me, I'm valuing where it's harder. So for me, getting my kids to and from their schedules, picking them up, driving, that isn't, doesn't require the level of intellect that presenting to the conference might, the challenge that presenting at a conference might. Although I would argue that some days the children's schedules are way more complicated than presenting at a conference. And I would think that, that it would be flipped. But the way that my brain is wired up until now is to say that I place greater value on presenting a speech. So my accomplishments saying that is a bigger accomplishment than getting kids everywhere that they, they get to be. Now, in reality, th- there is no greater or better or worse or higher or or lower. They are the same. They're both accomplishments. They both happened, but yet there's something about me that's labeling the professional accomplishment at a higher level than than the other, than the personal accomplishments. And so for you, what you get to look at is reflecting on the day and saying, what did I accomplish and get rid of that bias. So for me, I'm telling you, I had a bias that was about professional accomplishments versus personal accomplishments. So know that those bias can exist and and take those away, get rid of those. So saying, no, no, really, it's not about whether I'm judging them because that's what we're doing. We're judging our accomplishments. It's purely about what the accomplishment is. So it might be getting out of bed. That could be your accomplishment. It might be not hitting snooze. I got right up out of bed. I got a shower. I hear that's a big challenge right now. So for me, I'm on, I'm on a lot of Zooms. So coming on camera, that's one of my expectations for myself and the people that are around me, my clients, where we're on camera, we get to be in relationship, but I get that's not always how the rest of the world is. So for you, it might be that I take a shower when I get up, whatever that is, that gets to be held at just the, the, the exact same value as completing something at work. So think about that. What are your accomplishments reflecting at the end of the day? Because when you're present, it means that you acknowledge what you created. A lot of times we bust past that. 
yeah, that's been my past too. I get so excited about what I'm creating that I bust past my actual results and just move on to the next day. But that's not being present. Being present means I know what my results are. And number five, so this is our last tool for you. Number five is if I was coaching myself, how would I coach myself? So I often ask myself when my mind wanders to the what ifs, when I'm, I'm finding myself in this future worry, I think, how would I coach someone else? If I came to, my, to me with the exact same set of challenges, how would I coach myself? So when I know that, <coughs> excuse me, when I know that, then I actually use that. I'm in action towards that. So I said, Kathleen, if you were looking at exactly what's in front of you, and this was somebody else that came to you with this challenge, how would you coach them? And then I hear what I'm saying. And I do it. And then I reflect back. And that's also a practice. But it's tool number five in being present. It's understanding that you have the ability to coach yourself. Because who knows you better than anyone else in the world? You. So being present, being in relationship with your senses, knowing what's around you, you can use these five tools to support you. So let's just go through those again. Number one, your notice moments, knowing when your mind goes into the what if scenarios and bringing it back. Number two, meditation. That is really about giving yourself the space to breathe and be connected with what's happening in that moment. Nothing else matters in that moment, but being present with you. Number three, setting the intention for everything that you're creating, knowing that there is a reason and a purpose. And if you don't know what that is and it's not valuable to you, don't do it. Be present with what comes up around you. Number four, reflecting daily. Reflecting daily on what you accomplished. Getting rid of the bias that it's good, bad, ugly, perfect, all those things. Negative, positive. Those are just bias that you're putting, you're judging your accomplishments. So get rid of the bias and just say, what did I accomplish today? Relaxation is an okay thing to accomplish. That's also something when I'm being present with myself that I realize is a space I get to go into next. And number five, coach yourself. If somebody came to you with the exact same challenges that you are facing, how would you coach them? And then hear that and just adjust based on that. You are a smart, intelligent person. You get to set yourself up for success. And so if you have any questions on this, you can reach out to me, Kathleen at KathleenReason.com. This is something that we can dig even deeper. It's about being present in the moment as we work through the holidays that are coming up. This is a really great tool, a really great tool because it's very easy to get caught up in what's happening, to be in a reactive set mindset, but really being focused on being present is one of the biggest presents that you can give the people around you. Being focused on the present is one of the best presents that you can give to the people around you. Now, next Monday, we're going to talk about a very powerful subject, three signs emotional baggage is holding you back. So emotional baggage, that's that stuff in the past. So we've been talking all about future worry, but next week, we're actually going to dig into the past. What happens when we're attached to the past? What happens when those stories, those things that, that pop up, keep coming up? For example, when I was talking about how the my Reese's peanut butter cup and how the salt, when I actually took in more salt, it eliminated that need. There was the emotional piece of eating that I got to address too. The reason that that came up was because of a connection to my past. So that's what we're honing in on next week. Three signs, emotional baggage is holding you back. We have got an incredible lineup for the next year into the new year. We've got the, said my friend, the dietitian coming on. We've got uh, Sarah Burnson, who is a marriage and uh, family therapist who's going to talk about really getting through the holidays and some of that stress that comes along. We've got other emotional intelligence topics because we are all wrapping up the new year. We are focused on family and connection time. We've got kids that are going to be home from school. We've got a lot of stuff that's coming up and we get to recognize too. I get to recognize that that's a lot. (laughs) That is a lot. And it's okay. It's absolutely okay. There are tools that we can use to support ourselves our employees, our families, our everyone around us and ourselves in creating what we want. So use these tools, use the meditation, the notice moments, setting the intention 
the reflecting daily and the coaching yourself to support you as you move through the end of the year. I wish you so much success. Happy holidays. Enjoy. And I will see you next Monday for the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. Kathleen Reeson will return next Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Have a great week.